I am really, really excited to have a very dear friend uh, sitting across from me at my dining room table by the name of Julius Sis. How are you, Julius? Good. Nice to be here. It is great to have you here. A long time coming. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. The reason, the reason why I'm happy to have you here is because it's always nice to interview a friend. It really is. Because I, I didn't have to do a lot of research about you. I've just been watching you all these decades. Well, also, you're going to be taking for granted you think you know me. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> I may not, right? That's right. Yes. As, as there was in your art, there were a lot of shadows, perhaps, when we speak about Julius. A lot right? of shadows and hidden messages. Yes. Uh, the other thing, too, is that Julius is the executive director of Jews for Judaism. Uh, and if you've been under a rock for many years, you wouldn't have heard of them. However, if you are part of the Jewish community, you will know that Jews for Judaism uh, he, here in Toronto and Ontario and really it's the headquarters for Canada, is uh, probably the foremost uh, anti-missionary organization in the world. I, well, I, although we're based in Ontario because of the advent of the internet the last uh, six, seven, eight years, um, Jews for Judaism has had a, an incredible worldwide impact. I was doing my research on you, Julius, and I was phenomenally amazed by the quantity of videos, of articles, that one can find on your website. It's unbelievable. Well, the website, and I have to add to that, our YouTube channel, um, Jews for Judaism. Um, it's, it's not a coincidence that um, this has happened. I'm just gonna give you a little background on our organization. Yeah. I, I was a Jew for Jesus for five years, from 1976 to 1980. I love that. And um, it's, it's not so much I just happened to believe in Jesus and was Jewish. Uh, I was involved in the uh, in the grassroots uh, development of one of the major uh, messianic congregations here in Toronto back then, and uh, was a choir leader in the group. I did I was involved in adult education. I was the public relations director. Did their advertising. I was very very interested in spreading the message uh, to Jewish people. Uh, sadly, that uh, that uh, Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. And now, you I, do you believe that in your heart? You did believe I it. I did believe that in my heart. I, I I'm saying it. It took five years, and and um, uh, uh, with the help of many many uh, concerned uh, individuals in Toronto's Jewish activist community back then, uh, many of whom you know, reaching out to me, being a real Dracop, really, really just badgering me with with uh, arguments, calling me up, but being friendly, being loving, being kind, showing care and concern to a fellow Jew, it, it started to make a dent. It was a combination of many things, but uh, bo both experiencing the anti-Semitism in, in, in Christianity, experiencing the, the contradictions that exist, um, and, and eventually realizing that um, uh, based on all the inconsistencies that I discovered, I had made a huge mistake. Well, what was it like to believe in Jesus? Um, you know, it was What's my, Jesus like? You know, it, it, the, the experience was more not believing in the individual person, but believing in the uh, Christian presentation of God as a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy, Holy, uh, Holy Spirit, and that you had um, the, the, the idea that you can have a personal relationship with God by believing in by believing, uh, in their teachings. Uh, the, the big misconception, though, is that for a Jew to believe in the presentation of Christianity is, is uh, considered Id idolatry. Yeah, idolatry right. on three levels, because uh, first of all, um, to believe that God is a trinity. We, you know, we, it, 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 the Jewish people, we believe, hear Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, the Lord is, is one, one. Yeah. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And the oneness of God that we understand is without beginning, without end, it's infinite. It's not like a, a ballpoint pen that has ink, plastic, and metal. Mm -hmm. God is not like that. It, it doesn't come in components. And so for a Jew to believe in, in, in God as, as a trinity is idolatry, which is one of the three cardinal sins. Number two, to believe so that— So you were, you were an idol worshiper. Well, I, I didn't think of it at, at that time as such, but I— But looking to, back. Looking back, that's what it is. So so on Pesach, or when we read in the Torah, thou shall not have any other god other than me. You really get that. Well, except I, got, I, I didn't get it then. I thought I was, I was um, living the fulfillment of what Judaism was meant to be. The big, the big uh, catchphrase yeah. uh, amongst these uh, Hebrew Christian missionaries, of which there are hundreds, if not thousands, worldwide, 
is that if you know it, G Judaism believes in in the coming of the Messiah, if we could prove to you that Jesus is the the Jewish Messiah, what could be more Jewish than to believe in him? And this and this sales pitch was was very compelling, very and and to a Jew who has limited or no education, which most North American Jews suffer from. Um, the case for Christianity can be very compelling. And it, it can was for be. Me, it, very compelling. And I, you know, one of the uh, programs that we do at Jews for Judaism is um, the encounter. It's a mock debate between a Jew for Jesus and a Jew, a Jew for Judaism. Uh. And in that program, I'll come out with my Jews for Jesus t-shirt and spend a half hour converting the audience to Christianity. They don't know that I'm from Jews for Judaism. They think I'm, I'm Mitch Mandel from, uh, from Jews for Jesus. And uh, I... I I just didn't want to be on the same stage with Jews for Judaism. That's I'll walk cool. off after the program, and then the moderator brings in, announces Jews for, Jews, Jews for Judaism. It's Julius says, come on. I come back in without my T-shirt on, and oh, everybody has a big sigh of relief, and I debunk everything that the missionary um, uh, uh, purported to be true. But how successful are you in converting them the first half hour? Do, do they do they come out? Are they, I, sort of, are they, be, are they say, befuddled? You know what? It's not so much converting that they get very nervous. They get nervous. They get nervous because the case is very powerful. It's not so much that I'm reading by a textbook uh, definition. I'm I'm going about what experienced and changed my heart back yeah. then. Yeah. And some of the arguments can be very compelling if you know how to present it to a, an audience that doesn't know how to deal with it. It can make them very uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. So I want to stop you for one second because I want to understand your experience. Uh, both existential and emotionally. When you look back at, at, at to those days, and again, we're talking 1975 to 1980, first off, are you surprised that you could be convinced and are you disappointed in yourself that you were? I'm not surprised I could, it could be convinced because many thousands upon thousands of Jews are convinced. Yeah. The, and, and these are not stupid Jews. Uh, some of the leaders in the, in the Hebrew Christian movement are very intelligent, and I'm not going to uh, offer you their uh, websites and YouTube channels, but their presentations are extremely compelling yeah. and very convincing. The one thing that, that, that differs between them and, and the Jewish world um, is that they did not have a Jewish framework to uh, use as a basis to make these assessments and judgments. The presentation that was made to me as it is made to so, so many Jews is, is uh, in some cases, very simple. And again, I'm not using this, uh, I don't want to use this interview to, to make the case for Jesus. I want to make the case for Jews for Judaism. Yeah, we got that. Yeah. <laughs> we got that. <laughs> and, 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 why, and why Jews should believe in it. Because basically, basically, if Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, as the missionaries um, purport, then okay, that's, they got a good argument. But if he's not, then really what that means is Christianity is not true. And if it's not true, hello, Jewish people, wake up. We have, you know, we're going to be coming close to Pesach soon, where we celebrate uh, God's revelation to the Jewish people, his miraculous uh, uh, bringing us out of Egypt through the ten plagues, the parting of the sea, the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. These are not fables, as some people would have us believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. These are things that really happened. You know, uh, you know speaking of the, of the Passover Seder, I, I sometimes use my father as an example to... Um, to uh, illustrate the reality of the transmission of our story as a people. And my father was sitting at our Passover table uh, when he was alive, it was about five, six years ago. Nisan was his name. Nisan says, Nisan after the name of, uh, after the month of April, because he was born. Uh, God, bless us. God bless his soul. Amen. And, um, and I was in the beginning of the Passover Seder, we hold up the, the matzah, which we refer to as uh, the poor man's bread. And, and I start giving a little bit of an explanation about how the slaves in Egypt would take a piece of bread and, and, and take it in, in with them into the field so they could have something to munch on. And my father said, what are you talking about? <laughs> that happened to me. Yeah. And I said, what? what? He, said, he said, my father said that he had nothing to eat. He was, he had, he was starving in the concentration camp in, in World War II. And um, one of the fellow camp, uh, camp mates uh, uh, offered him a loaf of bread if he would give that camp, uh, camp inmate his boots. This was a very hard thing for my father to do because the boots were made by his father, my father's father, my grandfather. Yes. Uh, Leib Hakoin was a bootmaker. And he, he gave up the boots, wrapped his, his feet in uh, newspapers and, and, and uh, burlap sacks, and had that piece of bread to live on for two, three days, the poor man's bread. Wow. He said, That's the, this is the halach mania. This is the poor man. My point was there at the table was a survivor of a Holocaust that today 
millions upon millions of people say never happened. Yes. But we have the testimony at our table. And many, and you know, it's a, that testimony is something we've had transmitted. When we as a Jewish people have um, uh, an understanding of the reality of that experience, it's very hard to just discount God going out of his way to reveal himself to three million people when every other religion in the world, including Christianity, starts with the revelation of, of, of one individual saying they have the truth. Now, Julius, what was interesting is, and this is probably an experience of a lot of people, who become Jews for Jesus, is that you were sort of brought in by a woman, a girl that you liked, right? Um, I was interdating, and um, it was a very interesting story. Um, um, I, I was a student at the Ontario College of Art back in 1974, 75. A brilliant artist that you were. Well, not an artist, an illustrator. An illustrator. I, I, I differ with the definitions. Okay. But um, uh, and it was the graduate at, at the Ontario College of Art Back, back, back then as they do now have what is uh, referred to as the open house where they put on display the best work of the students in the school. Yeah. And I set up a display and sat by my display Friday night, Saturday, Sunday in hopes of uh, meeting an art director and being able to launch my career, which didn't happen then. But at the last hour of my display um, um, on the Sunday afternoon, along comes Mary Beth. Mary Beth is the beauty queen of the school. Gorgeous, <laughs> tall, vivacious, funny, humorous, interesting. She had it all. She comes up to me, and what yeah. am I? I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a six foot five, 120 pound Woody Allen kid with, <laughs> with acne all over my face. And I, I just was so nervous. My tongue went dry, my hands went clammy. I, how do you deal with such a beautiful woman? But she started asking me genuine questions about my work and my yeah. art and my feelings. And after an hour, I went, wow, this is amazing. So I said to her, you know, uh, I, gotta, I gotta wrap up, but maybe you'd like to go out tonight? And she said, yes. Oh, you I, asked her out. I asked her out that night. Yeah. And so we went out and we had a great time. So um, after that date, I asked her out if, if we go out the next week. And she said, okay. The next week we go out and um, uh, I, I, uh, I, 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 I did something you shouldn't say on a second date. I, I told her that I loved her. Yes. You don't do that on a second date. Yeah, give it a few little, little while. So I told her I loved her. And, and you talked, you talk had loved her. You did love her. Well, you know, it's crazy. I mean, I did. What does what, what a what does a young guy know about love? I so, just, so this was new for you. It was pretty amazing. I mean, she was amazing, gorgeous. Mm -hmm. But um, so uh, I told her I loved her, and she said, "Cool your jets. <laughs> yeah, take it easy." I'm like, what? I said, she says, "I'm in love with somebody else." And I went, what? <laughs> what do you mean you're in love with somebody else? You're going out with me two dates, and you're in love with somebody else? How can you do that? Yeah. And she says, I said, who is he? I'll tear his eyes out. Hey, Leah, what's his address? <laughs> yes. So she says, it's Jesus Christ. Oh, no problem. I can handle that. I thought you had a real boyfriend. <laughs> but she was dead serious. What, what I didn't realize is she was a, a, an evangelical Christian who had backslidden. And she, you know, the New Testament teaches that they should not be uh, unequally yoked. They should not be going out with people who are not believers. And she made a boo-boo. But she was trying to put her faith first. And with that in place, she thought maybe she can get our relationship back on track. And she did. I started going to church with her and to her Christian socials. And How was that, going to church? Um, Do you remember the again, first time I, you went? It was uncomfortable. I mean, I, you know, when, when your experience of, of uh, a house of worship is uh, that of a Jewish house of worship, where, um, you know, you, you have, uh, in, in my particular case, there's a machitz of the men on one side, the women on the other, um, and uh, th there it was quite, quite, quite different, but it was in, everything was in English. And, and again, I, 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 I wasn't um, going to church to be convinced, but the reality is listening to these um, evangelical messages from the pulpit does, does make an impact on you. And it moved me to a certain extent until uh, one Sunday afternoon, about uh, three months into the relationship, the pastor was very anti-Semitic and very uh, filled with hatred for Jews. Yeah. Don't ask me how that happened. And I walked out of there saying, you know what, I can't come back here. That's it. I was born a Jew. I'm going to die a Jew. Yes. And I just walked away from that church. Uh, she, in her haste, uh, tried to remedy the situation to figure out some way that she can get the gospel message to me. And she found out about this new messianic synagogue, as they call it, a Hebrew Christian church that had started up in Toronto to see if maybe she can get me to go there and finally hear the gospel in a way that would convince me that it was true. Right. And she did. She found out about this place, and I went. And there I went, and they called it a messianic synagogue. They had Friday night services. Um, the men were wearing kippot and talesim, 
and they, uh, they, they, they were playing beautiful Jewish music, Hine Matov, Sisu at Yerushalayim. All the That's stuff we know. All the stuff. We, I didn't know it then, but then I finally learned it. And, and then and the beginning of the service, a woman comes up and lights, lights the Shabbat candles, but instead of two candles, it's three to represent the Trinity. Then she says, L'hatlik ne'er shel Shabbat b'shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeah. I'm like, what's this b'shem Yeshua? The name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Right. And then the, the, the Messianic rabbi comes and he has a, a, a glass of wine. He says, Kiddush, Borei Pri Hagafen B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Again, in the name of Jesus. And I, okay, it's a little different, but you know, there was a lot of Jews there. And I, I started going to this group and she was right, it worked. And it was a methodology that unfortunately is being used in big ways all around the world today to convince Jews that you can be Jewish and believe in Jesus. It's very deceptive, it's very disingenuous. And, but what, what happened, it was a technology that was developed in the 60s that they found worked. Jews don't want to go to synagogue. Jews don't want right. to practice Jewish holidays. Right. Jews, Jews won't keep Shabbat. Oh, but to go to a messianic synagogue on Shabbat? Okay, that's different. Well, Jewish, let me ask you uh, something. In terms of your commitment to your Judaism, I believe you went to Sharitzvilla Synagogue? Which I went is, to Sher Shemayim when I was a kid. Which is an Orthodox synagogue. Yes. So... How orthodox were you or were you not? Okay, so I, I, to say I went to the synagogue, I went occasionally to the synagogue. I went to a cheder like a lot of my peers did. We, many kids were brought up by Holocaust survivors to go to the Hebrew school, a cheder, yeah. until the bar mitzvah. And most of us, after the bar mitzvah, left it, which I did. You know, once, the, the, once you had your bar mitzvah, it was the ticket to freedom. And uh, sadly, um, which is not unusual, and you, it, it, you hear this in the testimonials of many of the Jews who've converted to Christianity, they say, well, I was bar mitzvah at the age of 13. <laughs> right, you right. Know, But what, what did it do? Right. The reality is, thankfully, thankfully, I was brought up by parents that were traditional. They, they both grew up in traditional homes in Europe. And so the, there was a Shabbat at the home every Friday night. There was a Pesach Seder. My parents went to Shul Yorsh Hashanah Yom Kippur. And thankfully, when I was a kid, my father used to take me to shul occasionally on, on, on Shabbos. And I remember one of my, I had a few precious memories of my father, Nisan. One is on Simchat Torah, dancing with the, uh, on Simchat Torah at Sher Shemaim on St. Clair. And I was sitting on his shoulders, waving a flag of Israel with a little apple on top of it. That's a precious memory. Yes, love Another that. precious memory is sitting with him in shul and we're following along in the, in the Chumash and the, in the five books of Moses, the Torah reading. And he would have his finger on the place where we were, and I would have my hand on his finger as we went through. Oh, it's, lovely. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an imprint that you can never erase. It's, it's like a Rockwell painting, you know. Yeah, it's Rockwellian. So, so that's right. It is. Yes. So, um, but uh, but you know, my parents didn't know a lot, and uh, um, sadly, after my bar mitzvah, I had nothing to do with Judaism whatsoever. So the reality is, the closest thing to going into a synagogue in all those years after my, by my bar mitzvah was this messianic synagogue 13 years later. And it, and it was much more of a social thing than it was a religious no, no, thing. No, 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 it wasn't so. It was social, but it, it appealed. It appealed to the emotions. Everybody was friendly. Everybody was warm. and um, More, so, it, more it, so than the synagogues? Oh, yeah. yeah you, know, you can walk into a synagogue sometimes, and the most important thing somebody's going to say to you is, excuse me, you're sitting in my seat. Is that a problem in terms of... Well, no, you have to understand. And I hear this, you know, it's, it's not so much that in, in, the, in, the, in the church world, you know, they try to really promote their obedience to Jesus' instruction mm. of showing love. Mm. It's very important, you know, and, 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 and it's almost impossible not to feel it in any serious evangelical church because this is the way that people um, uh, welcome you and keep you. Um, and it's, it's not, sadly, uh, something that is evident in any significant way in synagogues. Most synagogues deal with uh, people who come on a regular basis, and it's not, it's not, um, it's not um, a venue in which you welcome seekers as a rule. It's Did you believe the love in the church? Was it authentic? How could you know? No, listen, somebody puts their arm around you and yeah. gives you a hug. Forget believing in it. Yeah. If you're a normal human being, you respond to love. What do you mean, believe in the love? You, such thing. you feel it. Yes. You feel it. Yeah. And, and these people are genuine. You know, when I, when I, when I, when I shake somebody's hand, I, 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 I give them a, a handshake because I, I feel it and they feel it back. Somebody fish, shakes your hand like a goldfish, you know they don't feel it. Yeah. You know, but um, but it's not hard to show love. It's what's hard to convince people is to do it. You know, that's the problem that we're lacking throughout the world. Forget Judaism, and you know the, the, those uh, uh, Christian groups that uh, 
uh, are working to convert Jews, uh, groups like Jews for Jesus and Chosen People Ministries and, the, and, for, and, and Friends of Israel Gospel Ministries, and all these, there, there are hundreds of them. They, they all basically focus on two things, to show a lot of love and to make Jews feel welcome. And uh, sadly, um, what I had initially started off to try and share with you about 25 minutes ago yeah. was that when I got started with this, uh, I realized when I came out of Christianity and realized that Christianity was not true and had been helped to realize that Judaism was true. Again, when I left Christianity, I was walking away with a, a book that was called the Holy Bible, yeah. okay, of which one quarter was the New Testament, and I could comfortably rip that out. But I was still left with the three quarters, which was the Jewish Bible, the right. Tanakh. Right. And that I believed. Right. I believed in the revelation at Sinai. I believed in the Jewish people coming um, out of Egypt. So much I believed in it. I really thought it was true. How could it not be true? And um, and so I, I didn't have to be given a strong reason to believe in the authenticity of Judaism. I just had to learn how to become a serious Jew. And that was something that I was um, helped with by going through organizations like Eshet Torah and Or Sameach and Chabad Lubavitch, organizations that, that helped me um, connect religiously. And then there were student organizations like the Jewish, the, they don't exist anymore, uh, uh, North, Jewish Student Network and universities, etc. Helped me connect socially with a lot of people. So, Julia, so, so you're going to this church, a Messianic church. Messianic you, synagogue. Yes, yeah, synagogue. You, sorry, Messianic synagogue. You take Jesus into your heart for all intents and purposes. You come home and you tell your parents that you now believe in Jesus. You are a Jew for Jesus. What happens at the table? What do your parents respond? That didn't happen. It did not happen? No. I didn't have the heart to tell my parents. Honestly. <laughs> Honestly. I'm telling you. I, no, so, I believe you. <laughs> I, so, let me, so let me do I will tell you what yeah. happened. Yeah, please. Um, um, I never told my parents. All they knew is that we would, you know how in Passover in, in some homes, they rush to get through uh, the Pesach Seder in time for the hockey game. Yes. So in, in my particular case, I rushed through the, the Shabbos dinner to get out in time to go to my Messianic service, which was idiot. So I'd rush, out of, I'd rush out of our Shabbos dinner at 7.30, and they would always ask me, where are you going? I said, I'm going to a shul. That's all. I didn't have the heart to say it. To them. I just couldn't. Meanwhile, I'm on the street corners handing out pamphlets, handing out wow. literature at the Hadassah Bazaar, trying to convert, but I couldn't tell my parents. They had that. both gone through the concentration camps. Yeah, my siblings knew, but, but my, my parents didn't, and I just didn't have the heart. But uh, at the end of my five-year tenure in the Hebrew Christian movement, I was really getting very active and doing whatever I could to promote the Messianic uh, Judaism that I had embraced. And I organized um, a very big concert at Northview Heights Secondary School um, had created uh, some uh, deceptive flyers of, of, of Hasidim dancing in front of the Kotel and, and did this uh, program, um, uh, musical program, advertised, put up posters all along Bathurst Street. Did you know they were deceptive? I, I designed them. So in your heart, did you know so, that? No, in my heart, I thought, well, if, if we can be Jews and believe in Jesus, it's the most authentic thing we could do. Uh -huh. So I, I embraced the deception as, as being true. Yeah, the deception was true. That's yes. very interesting. I embraced the deception as yeah. truth. Yes. So and I created these ads um, um, and um, posted them all across Bathurst Street. But, the, but the, the, the Jewish community caught on very quickly, knew that it was a ruse, and organized one of the biggest protests against Christianity in Toronto's history by a Jewish community. Outside North, Northview um, um, Heights Secondary School that evening, there must have been about 250 Jewish posters, protesters. And I was on the inside having organized the whole event yeah. and accepting tickets for people as they came in. And um, as people came in, I noticed a lot of these protesters had tickets. And I went, wait a minute. I produced these tickets. I was in charge of distributing the tickets. I sold the tickets. Where did they get the tickets from? Yeah. Until, with my artistic background, I took a careful look and noticed they were counterfeit. Were they? <laughs> <laughs> they printed up their own. You gotta love our people. Yeah, yeah. but my, my, my feeling was, what is it that those Jews know that can cause them to come out to protest what I'm doing that I don't know? Why is it they are so passionate about the mistake that I'm doing that they can go out and at cold winter night and 
have the press there. The, and again, it was covered covered by the press, the newspapers. What what was it that they they could know that I don't know? And it, it pardon the there's a, an expression in Christianity that I use in this particular case. Right. They, they they often say in Christianity they want to provoke Jews to jealousy. Well, these Jews provoke me to jealousy. For what is it they have that I don't have? Were you anyway, emba- were you embarrassed? No, I was proud at the time. Like people co- would show up whom you knew, I imagine. Well, you know, I, I, you, know, I, you know some of the people that were there, but um, some of the protesters. But my point is this, yeah. that this made the front page of the Toronto Star, front page of the Globe and Mail, front page of the Toronto Sun, was in Canadian Jewish News. And um, I, I, I hinted to, to my career as an illustrator. By this time, I was a, a famous Canadian illustrator. I had illustrations on the cover of Maclean's magazine, Toronto Life magazine, Canadian Business magazine. I was a, a real celebrity, and my father would, when he would, he used to work in a sweatshop on Spadina on the sewing machines. What did he, would, he make? Uh, he would, m- women's coats. He was a cloak maker. Yeah. And he would come into the shop on Monday after a weekend, and he would bring in a magazine that I illustrated. He would show this his 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 linesman, look what my son made a beautiful picture, <laughs> you know. And he would be proud. This he would, would have the, nachas. He would have nachas. But this particular Monday, after all the newspapers published these things on the sun, he came in and his cronies were holding the paper in front of my father and goes, oy. "This is your oy. son. You're proud of. He's a missionary." Oy. Oy. And my father was sick about it. Oh, that yeah. night, that Monday night, we were supposed to have a family celebration. And I came to the door with a cake. And my father stood at the door. And he pointed at me. He says, you're not my son anymore. Oh, yeah. Get away. That was his reaction. He didn't know how to deal with it. But he basically disowned me. That was a game changer. To realize that uh, my father had to stand up for what he to believe to, even though he was not sophisticated enough to explain or have the discussion with me, he just slammed the door in my face. Um, so that that you, you remember that moment? Yes. So mm-hmm. when you so the whole what brought this t- discussion on was the, me telling my parents. It wasn't until that m- po- moment, almost five years later, at the tail end of my involvement, that my parents found out and they disowned me. When, when you say they disowned you, how did that translate? My, well, my to translate my mother kept up communication. My father wouldn't speak to me. He wouldn't talk to you? No. No. But uh, my point was that after this all happened, and I came out of Christianity, and I basically wanted to go into neutral, um, neutral meaning I didn't want to do anything, I had a very interesting story happen to me. Actually, I was, I was very critical. I had a friend um, who um, I knew since I was 14, um, uh, and um, her name was Charlotte. And um, we ended up being friends as uh, teenagers, and then she ended up going to Newtonburg Secondary School, and she was in my class, and right. we just always were good friends. At the point when I started getting involved in Christianity, she got involved in Judaism. At the point where I was taking Christianity more seriously, she ended up getting married to a rabbi. Mm-hmm. But throughout all the years, she kept in touch with me. Over the course of my five-year involvement in Christianity, she always would call me up when she'd come to town, you know, invite me over for a Shabbat meal or come for a glass of tea, and I would never stop, never hesitate to tell her about the importance of believing Yeshua HaMashiach, that mm-hmm. he's the Messiah. Mm-hmm. And she'd listen to it for a bit, and she'd say, okay, enough. You know, <laughs> yeah, I get it. Yeah. This particular, um, at this particular time after I had that concert behind me, and I had a lot of, with a lot of, lot of reasons to question the validity of Christianity, she called me up to say hello, and she, and she, after five minutes, said to me, Julius, what's the matter with you? And I said, what do you mean? She says, well, every time we've spoken for the last five years, you would jump into telling me to believe in Jesus, and you haven't said boo. And I said, well, it's because I'm having doubts. Yeah. Oh, really, doubts? What kind of doubts? And I've explained to her about you know the inconsistencies with the Messianic prophecy and and the whole issue of anti-Semitism and the whole issue of how could the New Testament be true when all the contradictions exist. And she said, you know, I, I, have you spoken to a rabbi about this? And uh, I said, no. She said, well, why? I said, I said, the only rabbi that I think I could speak to is the rabbi that was... Um, interviewed in all the newspapers that I ended up being when I was doing my shenanigans with my Messianic congregation. And I don't think he would believe me. Yes. And she says, and she said, what rabbi is that? I said, that's Rabbi Emmanuel Shochet. And she says, well, he's a good friend of mine. He'd believe me. Can I give him a call and see if he'll meet with you? She, she dealt with you well, Charlotte, didn't she? Yeah. 
So she called up Rabbi Shochet. Rabbi Shochet immediately said, sure, let him come this evening. And I spent four hours with him that mm-hmm. evening. Mm-hmm. And after he helped reaffirm my understanding of the mistakes I made and introduce even more questions about the uh, inval- inv- invalidity of the Christian claim for uh, having truth with Jesus being the Messiah, um, he said to me, you know, you just spent five years of your life um, promoting Christianity. Why don't you just spend five months of your life checking out Judaism? He, he recommended I go to a Shator here in Toronto, which had just started up an organization to uh, reach out to uh, Jewish adults and because uh, um, there's a big need here in the city. And it, I, I was excited, excited to um, start learning about the Judaism I never knew about. And over a period of time, over the course of the year, year and a half, um, I uh, was involved with the group. They decided to do a video of um, their students to just hear the story, what brought them to um, come to learn about Judaism. And nobody had heard my story before. They put me in front of a video with a microphone, and I told them my story about having been a Jew for Jesus. Everybody's tongues were hanging out, and that launched my counter-missionary activism career. It's a great story. Yeah, well, and so I started being asked to speak about my experience, being asked to be uh, counseling individuals, asked to, uh, I started publishing uh, ads in the Canadian Jewish News, literature, whatnot, and it was just a hobby, being anti-missionary, until I realized this stuff is getting too much of a problem, and um, I realized there has to be an organization that deals with this, and I I met with... um, I met with the leader of a, a, a big Jewish organization in the city to see if they could help fund some kind of a counter-missionary budget. And I went to him and I said, you know, we really need to have some good classes. We need to have to good counseling. We need some programming. We need literature. Uh, we need audio tapes at that time. And da 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 He said, you know, Julius, uh, you know, I, I, I really appreciate the, the, um, the um, dilemma you're in, but we can't help you. Right, right. He said, but I do know somebody who can. And I said, who? And he pointed the finger at me. Right. And I realized then, you know what? Got to do this. And so that's when I took it on to start the organization, Jews for Judaism, back in 1989. And for my first program, I brought in uh, Rabbi Michael Skoback from New York, who right. was involved with Jews for Judaism there at that time. And our first program was called The Missing Jews. It was a two-day uh, evening, of, two-evening event that went through all the arguments against Christianity, talking about the dilemma. And that was basically uh, where we took off from. And the rest is history. It's, uh, we're now in our 31st year. And uh, you know, Rabbi Skobek has been instrumental in terms of his uh, education and helping our organization move forward. And today, if you take a look at um, what we have online, um, uh, almost everything that we have on our YouTube channel are lectures by him where he uh, either dissects Christianity or cults or, or promotes really out-of-the-box uh, perspectives on Judaism. Yeah, I know. As I said before, I was uh, watching some of those YouTube videos, and it, I know Michael very well, and I've known him for many years. I was also instrumental in, in keeping him here. I don't know if you know that. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I yeah. remember that he had been in the hospital, and uh, we won't go into the details, and it was looking for... Uh, he was. He needed some work, and you found him the assignment at the uh, Hillel. I put in a good word for him, and they uh, and they hired him. So I was really happy. I think he's made a huge difference to our community. He's a lovely human being. You have a great staff, Carol, Carol Spodek, who's yeah. your admin person. Yeah, yeah. She, just she really beautiful, is, beautiful she, people. Really, she's the captain of the ship. <laughs> she runs the ship, right? <laughs> right. Because you're, you're you're not that that your strengths are not finances and things like that. Well, right? you know, she, it's it's she between the database, working with the public. You know, she's answering the phone. She makes a lot of fundraising calls. She's at all our events. She greets the people, uh, and she knows the community. She knows the Jewish community very well. One of one of the things I think that many people think. And tell me if you agree with this or not. When it comes to people like Bob Dylan, who went through his gospel uh, phase, who went through his Christian phase, was an evangelical Christian. Of course, he was born Jewish. You often hear from people how critical they are toward him about being sort of namby-pamby in terms of his spirituality. I kind of looked at it the other way around, and I, I really appreciate people who pursue truth, do it with a vengeance, do their very best to figure things out, and ultimately to you know arrive at the place that's best for them. Looking back on it, I guess the first question I have is, uh, are, are people still critical of you for going down that road? 
And secondly, over the years, how have you digested it? How have you come to the grips with the fact that for five, six years, you were a believer in Jesus Christ? You know, the, the, um, the rationale is that uh, some of the best advocates for drug abuse are people who were drug users. Mm -hmm. Some of the ve best advocates against uh, any kind of sexual abuse are people who had been abused. Mm -hmm. And I was spiritually abused. I felt that I had to speak out against this huge wrong right. and injustice. Right. And so I, I, I use the word vendetta. I'm on a vendetta. I will not stop doing what I can to hinder, if not destroy, the effort of Hebrew Christian missionaries, any Christian missionaries trying to convert Jews. And that's why I've been so passionate, and driven, and motivated nonstop to do what I can on not only what was originally just the local level, but now it's very clear that what we're doing is international. We're covering the globe and bringing Jews back to Judaism. And it, it gives me so much satisfaction. We get so many emails from so many people whose lives have been turned around from this video, from this pamphlet, or from, from this interview. And, and um, when, when, when I realized, you know, one of the... Um, um, uh, monikers of our organization quotes the Talmud that says, whoever saves a single Jewish soul is yeah. as if they've saved an entire Jewish world. And for me, I just, I, I, I get such satisfaction knowing that with the help of, of our, our staff at Jews for Judaism with Rabbi Skobak and Carol, that, that we're making a huge impact. And um, it's, it's exciting. Um, so, so someone here by the name of Rachel Mursky, you know that name? I'm not the best she, on names. Yeah, she's on your uh, website, and uh, she went through your program. She writes, I grew up in Montreal and had a fairly typical Jewish background. Uh, because I never really understood how Judaism could apply to my life in a meaningful way, after my bat mitzvah, which is what you were saying about your bar mitzvah, I decided that I had had enough of Jewish learning. And she goes through this uh, really well written letter about how you know she came in touch with a Christian friend and ultimately started doing what you did, you know, attending their services. And six months later, she said she decided to convert to Christianity. She told her parents about it um, and her grandparents, and they strongly urged her to find meaning in her own religion. The long and short of it, she found you guys. She said, I finally got the courage to email the Jews for Judaism office in Toronto. Rabbi Michael Skobach contacted me immediately, and we began, we, we began corresponding. Because I felt totally accepted, just as I was, it was very comfortable communicating with him, and his long emails in response to my questions about Judaism were always very clear and convincing. And ultimately, she gave up her pursuit of Christianity and came back to her Jewishness. This is not an anomaly. This, is, this, is, this happens all the time by us. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty amazing. And... Uh, you know what? It's it, 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 it actually when you, when you when you are working so hard to, to achieve a goal, and 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 then you get a letter like that, it, yeah. it, it makes you want to cry. Yes, you know because you know it it's worth it. It's worth it. It's it's not like you're in a, in a, in a factory watching a, a piece of wood go down a line and chop chop chop. You're actually seeing change happening to people's lives. Right, and it is so encouraging. Um, and I think that that. It is um, uh, another moniker uh, of Jews for Judaism is keeping Jews Jewish, where we do whatever we can. It could be that not every Jew that comes to us is somebody who has questions about Christianity. Today, more than ever, Jews are coming to us because they got questions about Judaism. Mm -hmm. Why be Jewish? Like, what's the point? Um, I, was, I, was, I was at a, um, a Shabbat um, in Maple um, uh, not too long ago, and uh, giving a, a basically a series of lectures on my story and the Hebrew Christian problem. And in the question and answers around the lunch, um, a father was there with his son, and the father said, my, 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 my son has a question for you. And, and um, he, the, the son said, you know, uh, why can't I intermarry? Why can't I marry somebody who's, who's not Jewish? And I, I, I said to him, you know, what, you, what you're saying is, is exactly what happened to Rabbi Skobek when he was speaking at the uh, University of uh, Windsor a number of years ago. He was speaking on the missionary problem, and somebody asked him to stop. Uh, they're not interested in hearing about the missionary problem. They asked the same question, why can't I, why can't I marry a non-Jew? 
And then Rabbi Skobek said to him, he said, you know, you, you, you're, 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 you have a very good question, but you're asking the wrong question. Mm-hmm. What you really should be asking is, why should I be Jewish? Yeah. And I, I was fortunate I was able to direct this fellow at this, um, at this Shabbaton to go to our website. We had a, 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 a video that we just put up the, the day, week before by Rabbi Skobek, why be Jewish? And that is a big, big issue for many, many people today. And, and rightfully so. They don't get it. No, rightfully so. I, I did an interview with Rabbi Karopkin. I don't know if you heard it or not. Rabbi Karopkin, actually, he's a rabbi in Toronto. He interviewed me, really, and he asked me, um, what happened to me? Why did I leave orthodoxy, right? And we had a very meaty and hearty conversation about why I did. Uh, you know, a lot of it had to do with my upbringing, and a lot of it had to do with my education, yeshiva, and so on. Um, but I think, Jewish, there are many reasons why a person would not want to affiliate themselves with our community. It can be a highly judgmental community, right? It can be a very difficult community. Standards are inordinately high. And uh, I have I, to stop you right there. I think, I think you're being a little harsh and um, bigoted uh, because <laughs> really, no, I, because um, bigoted as you can't know what, no, well, maybe I'm using the wrong word, but yeah. uh, you, you, you can lump some people who have, uh, character traits that um, may not be so desirable, but the, the case for Judaism, which is what I'm talking about, when I when I say we have a, a a program called Why Be Jewish, you know what you're saying is why associate with that community or this community, but the question isn't that. The question is why should a Jewish person right. embrace the God-given legacy that the Almighty gave us at Mount Sinai? That's it. You know if you have a problem associating with a particular community in your passion to fulfill that uh, mitzvah of observing the Torah, that's one issue. But um, the case for revelation and God's uh, intervention in the lives of the Jewish people is the issue, and, and making the case for why Judaism is, in essence, the only path for the Jewish people is is what we get to at Jews for Judaism. I'm not going to argue. There's a lot of schmutz out there. There's a lot of uh, hypocrisy. There's a lot. Well, the, uh, n- nobody's perfect, and we right. all experience it. But the, but when the cows come home at the end of the day, we got to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of the existence of ourselves as a Jew? No, I, I, you know? I hear you. What I'm telling you is that my son is 13 years old, and I have his. I, he sits around... Uh, our table with his buddies who are also Jewish. It's very interesting because he goes to public school and his very close friends are Jewish. That's an interesting dynamic. His very close friends are? Are, yeah, Yeah. they are. It's a very interesting dynamic that occurs, you know? Well, except except the dynamic is there's a common denominator amongst all his friends. They're all going to the public school. Yes, but there is honestly next to nothing Jewish about these kids. And, and, And when you ask them... What do you think about Judaism? They could care less. Well, because they don't know anything about Judaism. R- right. And and they are, um, many of them are atheists. Only because they don't know what Judaism is. And the sad thing is that, that it's a sad statement on the parents. We got a situation where, and you know, I, I see it as a Holocaust, a son of a Holocaust survivors. Um, our generation, right, the, you know, the first generation off the Holocaust, already we were falling off the dare, falling off the path, as they say. And the children that many of my peers have brought up are already even in, in a less uh, affiliated situation. The question that has to be asked is if there is relevance to being Jewish, if there is, you know, that I guess maybe, maybe one of the questions we have to ask is there a God? Yeah. Maybe a lot of people have a hard time dealing with that issue. But the case for God is also a very powerful case to be made. But if there is a God, who is he? And... And, and and how did he express his interest in the world? And so it, it, with fast-tracking, without exception, every religion in the world starts with someone claiming that they had a re- revelation from God, and they're going to try and pass it on to all their followers, with one exception, the Jewish people, who witnessed God's revelation three million strong. And that, that's, that's a big claim. It's kind of hard. And quite honestly, I've, I've heard people try to refute that claim, but the arguments that support the revelation of the Jewish people's experience at Mount Sinai and coming out of Egypt is so so compelling and so powerful, one that we're going to be celebrating in, in another six weeks at Passover. Um, L- listen, I, I understand what you're saying, and I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not trying to undermine in any way the work that you're doing. 
what I'm trying to do is encourage it by, by saying that your, your battle is a very, very tough one. And the reason why it's so tough in our day and age in 2020, and I see it, and I see it firsthand, is because God is not near as relevant in our day and age where we live, how we live, to many young people. I think that Judaism has done its job very well. So Most of the world believes in one God, okay? But the other people are coming along and they're saying, you know what, I, I, my, my, my life is just fine. I do not see the relevancy of God anymore. And I'm hearing that, I'm hearing that from my kids. Um, that is the exact same mindset of the type of Jews that we deal with, mm -hmm. and Jews for Judaism, who ultimately get enticed into Christianity, Eastern religions, etc., because sometimes the presentation by these other groups um, goes beyond that and, and does make the case. So um, what we see are there many, many Jews who had that mindset for the longest, longest time yeah. until some other ism came along to show them that you're wrong. There is a spiritual existence in this world, and whether it's Christianity or or, or one of these other Eastern religions that does the job. There are people who, from a Jewish background, who had the mindset that God was irrelevant, that change their mind when somebody else makes the presentation in a different way that doesn't include Judaism. Which brings up the question, well, wait a minute, is there or is there not a God? If, if, if there is, then we have to examine this issue. But I have to admit that we are faced with a, a big dilemma that the entire Jewish world has to deal with mm -hmm. is, is, is making God relevant in the Jewish world. Yeah. I think and it, it goes beyond uh, denominations, whether it's Reform, Conservative, uh, Orthodox, Reconstructionist. We have a, a real dilemma where in, in, in many cases people who um, attend the congregations have questions, have yeah. issues, and and maybe there has to be a transformation that takes place. Maybe there's got to be some kind of a, a a crusade, pardon the pun, that takes place that goes out of its way to um, reinvigorate the Jewish community into w why we should embrace the Almighty and be able to make the case for him. I want to take a step back for a second. You used an interesting phrase before, which was the... Uh, I've never heard this before. Is, uh, you said that you were spiritually abused, and you, and you said it's almost like there's a vendetta that you have. You, you're clearly angry, right? Vendetta. Not angry? No, no, no. Well, I'm vendetta angry. implies anger. Vendetta means uh, you could interpret it as revenge. Mm. Um, here's the thing: I got ripped off. Yeah, yeah. How? This is what I, I want. got burnt. This, I got, this is what I, I want to hear because I was sold a false bill of goods. Yeah. I was sold, and had I continued on that path, had I married into that whole, I, I, who knows how much damage I would be doing for the Jewish world, or vice versa, how much I would be helping the Hebrew Christian movement had I stuck around. But, um, but it's based on a lie. It's based on an untruth. It's based on a false presentation that without having a strong... Um, uh, background in some of the fundamentals in Judaism most Jewish people are buying into. And I was able to see the um, mistake that has been perpetuated on many Jewish people. And so when I say vendetta, you know, but there's a movie once about some guy yelling out of a window. He says, I'm, I'm so mad, I can't take it anymore. That was network. That was network, okay, yeah. whatever. But I, 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 I cannot allow this to happen. I got to do what I can do in any way possible to thwart, to diminish, to, to, to eradicate the effort of these Hebrew Christian groups that are devastating the Jewish world. And by the way, it's not in North America. In Israel, it's huge. Yeah. In Israel, it's a huge problem. You know, some, some people ask me, um, you know, Jews, I, I, I don't see such a big missionary, missionary problem today. I'm, I don't see them on the corners anymore. They're not knocking at my door, and they're right. Missionaries aren't stupid. They're going, you know, I, I think it was uh, um, Billy the Kid or Jesse James was asked, why do you rob banks? <laughs> yeah. And he said, that's where the money is. <laughs> so, so the missionaries aren't stupid. They're going where the Jews are. Yeah, how successful and are they? It's huge. How, how big is it? In, well, it, it, there's... Um, Evidence that suggests over 30,000 Israelis, let's put it in perspective, 
at, 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 at back in 1948 when Israel was established, there was no such thing as Hebrew Christian congregations, and maybe there was maybe maybe a hundred Jews who believed in Jesus, in 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 Israel today, um, it, the propaganda suggests that there are over 30,000 Jews, Israeli Jews, who believe in Jesus, mm-hmm. uh, with over 150 Messianic synagogues in that country, and all major Christian missionary organizations that have any focus on trying to convert Jews are stationed there, all of them, and they're having some great success. They go after Russian Jews, don't they? They go after all Jews. They have some organizations have a specialty in reaching out to Russians, so those groups will specialize in the Russians. Other ones go after French, whatever. So, But it's, it's, a, it's a misconception to think that they're only targeting Russians. They're targeting all Jews. In my experience, in monitoring the activity that happens here in Israel, and I've gone to some of these Messianic congregations on a Friday night in the summer when Shabbat is late. I'll go and be outside and, and greet people as they're coming in. They don't like it. But I see who's going into some of these places, and it's a mix. It's a mix. There are some. There are mostly um, North American Jews, but there are Russian Jews. There are elderly Jews. There are Israeli Jews. Mm-hmm. There are Jews of color. You get you get all kinds. And then also because these places are churches, many Gentiles as well. But it's a mix. One of the things that really that is important for me to do this is to put a face behind this quote-unquote anti-missionary organization. And I'm able to speak to these people and be friendly and have rich and rewarding conversations. It's, um, and, and, and from that, we're able to do follow-up and have discussions. I'm assuming these guys really don't like you. Hate <laughs> They must hate you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they don't like it. But um, How do they, do they try to undermine you? Uh, they put um, the word out that Julius Sis is here or Michael Skoback is here? No, they, they, um, they, the, the, um, Edict is put out not to talk to us. Not to talk to not you guys. Not to talk to you. Yeah, don't talk to these guys. And uh, that, that uh, for ten years, our organization was uh, in, in Seals and Bathers next to one of these missionary organizations. Oh, I remember. Their congregants were under strict orders not to speak to us. Yeah. Why don't Why don't we proselytize? Why don't Jews proselytize? Um, I do know that Judaism. I, I'm not a rabbi, so I can't give you a, a, an in depth, um, conclusive answer to that issue. Uh, but we're not a proselytizing uh, uh, um, religion. We were, uh, as, as was um, uh, mentioned in the Torah, supposed to be a light to the nations. We are supposed to be an inspiration for the nations. And the uh, obligation that we have is to be able to show that there is a God-given morality for the world, a, a system of justice that exists, a system of kindness and pa- compassion that we should be able to be displayed. Whether we're succeeding at being this, this a light to the nations, a nation of priests is a different issue. But, but, but by nation of priests, what we, what, what, what we should understand that word means, we're not supposed to be running uh, religious services. Yes. We're, it's supposed to be a, a synonym to the word teachers. We're supposed to be teaching the world. And uh, in, in the Messianic age, as we know it, when, when the Messiah does finally come, we know that there will be two types of people. There will be the Jews, and there will be the non-Jews. The non-Jews have a path to the seven laws of Noah that, they're, uh, 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 that they can embrace and allow them to have a personal relationship with God. Rabbi Skobak, in fact, teaches here in Toronto uh, once a month a, a, a class strictly for Noahites. No Jews allowed. It's, it's very interesting. No Jews allowed, just for the non-Jews. And he has a, a large following of, uh, of non-Jews that um, are interested in pursuing the path to God that doesn't obligate the Gentile to have to observe the, the 613 commandments. And he also has a, 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 bi-week, a bi-monthly um, 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 podcast that he works with as well. I think that's contentious, by the way. The idea as to what the world will look like when the Messiah comes. I'm not an authority on it. But yeah, just, everything's a, in Judaism. But, everything's a machloket. Everything's no, 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 an no, argument. The, the simple, I, I'm not simple, sure that's cut and dry. No, but a simple analysis of the of the world based on the the um, references we use yeah, in our yeah. um, um, argument against Jesus is that. That they're, they're, clearly there will be a, a in the messianic age though it'll, it'll, Jerusalem will be relevant, the temple will be there, all all the world will believe in, in God, and 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 there will be no more war. And it's it's evident from 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 the uh, um, narrative that the Jews will be once again um, involved with the temple worship, 
and non-Jews will be coming to also right, right, worship right. in the no, temple. I hear that. And there'll, there'll be just like uh, two I'll entities. tell you, I'll tell you a compelling thing, Julius, is that I sometimes give classes myself, and some of which I give at Via Hafta, which is a Jewish humanitarian organization here in Toronto, and I'll give it to to the staff. And most recently, I gave a class on Lashon Hora, which is uh, speaking badly about other people or translated in the vernacular as gossip, right? And I, uh, I used uh, quotes from across the Torah. At the end of March, I'm going to be giving a class on the Talmud because I'm actually learning Daf Yomi, which is the seven and a half year cycle to go through the entire Talmud. And I sit there and I firstly enjoy it very much. I get a lot of uh, hana, as they say, out of a lot of pleasure mm -hmm. because I'm teaching something which I think is valuable. And there is a side of me which thinks at times what I'm presenting these people with, and again, most of the staff are not Jewish, is so significant that if they would be compelled to become Jews, that would make me very happy. I don't go in there to make them Jews, but in the back of my mind, I think we have a gift. We have a treasure here. Wouldn't it be great if people accepted it? So I'm interested in well, how so you, you know that, that, pheno that. that phenomenon is something we're experiencing at Jews for Judaism. Um, you know, um, in my vendetta, yeah. uh, one of the things I did was start our YouTube channel because I felt it was uh, very important to broadcast Rabbi Skobak's uh, important messages, not only uh, to, to have them here in Toronto, but let, let the world see what we have to say. Our goal was to um, keep Jews Jewish. Right. And so when we put up these videos, it was to show Jews why Christianity is not true and why Jesus is not the Messiah. That, that was our message. You know, it wasn't for, you know, we didn't want to ruffle feathers. But what has happened is because the bulk of the world um, is not Jewish and because the bulk of the people that are watching our videos are not only not Jewish, but they are Christian, we're finding a lot of Christians are coming away from Christianity as a result of Rabbi Skobek's teachings and coming to him and saying, we can't believe in Christianity anymore. What do we do? Mm -hmm. And so what's happened is it's, it's uh, a phenomenal uh, um, um, thing to witness is the consistency, the growth, and the quality of the number of people who are coming out and how they express their disappointment having wasted 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years in Christianity only to discover it's not valid, but now to discover the truth. And so while some are um, following through on the um, direct, the, 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 the uh, um, teaching of the Noahide laws, there's some that say it's just not good for us, not good enough for us. We want more. Right. And many are coming to Judaism. They yeah, it's just, fascinating. Because they see the veracity of the mm -hmm. Torah. And, you know, one of the things we teach, you know, you know, a, a, a non-Jew can have a relationship with God, has a place in the world to come without having to do those 613. You don't have to. But there are some that say, I want it. I want it. And the passion, the drive, the the love, the 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 commitment that is expressed by some of these people, it's phenomenal, it's just phenomenal. And uh, and again, maybe you should have uh, Rabbi Scobay come in sometime, do a talk on this issue alone, because it is a game changer in the Jewish world. It, it never, we never had this before. Yeah, I know, I know. And with the advent of the internet and what we're doing, even a decade ago, you just never, never hardly saw this. Well, in South but Korea, there's an avalanche. In South Korea, they're studying the Talmud. And, and the Duff Yomi cycle just started, and there's an awful lot of non-Jews who are studying the Talmud. I'm sure. Can, can one be a good Christian, though? Listen, here's the thing. When you say, can one be a good Christian? Can one be a good Christian? Can one be a good Buddhist? Can one be a good Muslim? Can one be a good Hindu? Yes, you could be. Being good yeah. and embracing a path to God, at least there is a sense and focus on the spiritual. The question isn't um, about being good. Most of these uh, faith systems have formulas in place to allow their adherents to have rich, rewarding, good lives. Mm -hmm. And and we won't go into the, those that fall off that uh, uh, path, but um, being a good Christian, it, the question isn't that. We're talking about in terms of um, Jews. You know, that that's, and, and, and for Jews, the, the, we can't have a Jew who's going to be a good Jewish Christian. They could be good, but they're involved in a religious path that's not that's not true. But for the rest of the world, the nations, 
you know, it, it, Rabbi Skovak deals with this uh, question all the time. Yeah, there, there, there is uh, no um, uh, army that's going out to try them, pull them away from their faith. You know, the the, the hope. And again, I I'm not an authority on this topic right, to be able right. to to, uh, to elaborate on it. But but the phenomenon is out there. That what what I wanted to point out was the phenomenon of many people, even Christianity, who are not Jewish and realizing there's a valid alternative out there that we're never aware of, and this is a phenomenon, I used the word a moment ago, an avalanche of people who are exiting Christianity who are realizing there's a path that, that the Torah teaches that is for them that they were never aware of, and it's, it, it's, it's a game changer for many of these people. So you started out a little bit different in life. We mentioned it before that you were an illustrator. Yes. So firstly, you said that there's a difference between being an artist and an illustrator. What's the, what's the difference between the two? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I, um, not only was I an illustrator, I, I was an illustrator for three decades, and most of those three decades I was also a professor at the Ontario College of Art and Design teaching illustration. And, and yes. In one of those classes, um, and it just um, in one of those classes, um, one of the students asked, Mr. Siss, what do you do? What kind of artwork do you do when you're not illustrating? Yeah. And I freaked them out. I said, I don't. I know. I and they know. said, what do you mean you don't? I said, I don't. I, I have no desire for the artwork whatsoever. And they couldn't get it. And I said, you don't understand. I only do it for the money. Yeah. So what happened was in high school, I did it because it got me the best marks. And I was able to get an average, at least a almost an Ontario scholar, but I did great, great in art in high school. And so it was, I got it for marks. And when I went to the Ontario College of Art as a student, I, I got marks. And um, eventually when I graduated, I realized I can make a living doing this kind of image image making. And I hope that maybe you'll be able to display uh, one of my people. Actually, I, I sent you a self-portrait I did for the cover of Toronto Life. Right, right. But um, um, what I realized is, I can make a living doing this. And I made a, a living and I, I developed a good re reputation, but it was always uh, hired for money. And the three motivations for me to do this work was number one, I needed an assignment that either was really interesting to start with or in which they gave me freedom to come up with a creative solution. Number two, I needed an assignment that was of high exposure. I didn't want to do an assignment for somebody's bar mitzvah invitation. Yeah. You know, I wanted I wanted something to be seen. So when a I did cover a, of McLean's. Well McLean's got seen back then by three million people. So that that's yeah. good exposure. How many people get their artwork seen by three million yes, people? Yes, exactly. And lastly, I wanted some decent money. So the and the fringe benefit in almost all cases, I got the artwork back because I'm only selling the rights to the image. So um, a lot of my images, and by the way, if people want to see some of my images, go to my website, juliussis.com, J-U-L-I-U-S-C-I-S-S.com. Yeah. Yes. You'll see some of the over 400 images I did in my career. And are you proud of those images? I'm, I'm proud because of the creativity, and um, um, I did a good job. I, you know, I know I did, and some, a lot of them, but not a lot of them, some of them I I, I won awards from the Art Directors Club, yeah. and from Graphs, and different associations around the world. I won awards for excellence in the work that I was doing. But uh, more than anything is, is um, and I, I mentioned this in a private conversation I had with you before, people ask me um, uh, after um, having had, pardon me while I take a sip, they asked me if I miss um, painting. And uh, for many years, I didn't know how to answer that. And I realized question isn't do I miss painting the question is do I miss creativity mm. and what I loved about this work every job was always so different from the next it was creative having um, an opportunity to incredible creativity being expressive the whole idea of having self-expression and having identity <clears throat> not as a, a painterly artist but as, in a way like a performing artist a performing artist I'm able to make statements that got seen by many people so Sadly, I, I don't do it today, but I don't miss it because um, the reality is through the work I do with Jews for Judaism, I get the chance to exercise a lot of my visual creativity through our advertising, through our videos, through our through our graphics, etc. So, um, so I don't miss it. Um, yeah, it was quite fascinating because when you were setting up, not only are we broadcasting this via uh, a podcasting mechanism, uh, which is... Uh, uh, audio, but you also set up cameras, so we're actually filming this. Yeah, I'm, we're filming this for a uh, YouTube channel, the uh, um, podcast. Yeah. yeah, and you said while you were setting it up, I was really impressed because there's one, two, what, three different cameras? Five cameras. There's five cameras, and you said you want this to be like an art piece, 
right? It's not just simply putting a camera here and lighting here. Well, I have to give the palette to the editor. He's got to have what to work with. If yeah. I just gave him one camera, duh, it's kind of boring. But now the editor can be creative with the work he's doing, she's doing, and turn this into something that will be visually stimulating, right. not only in terms of knowledge and spiritual inspiration. Yeah, I know. I found that fascinating. And I'm assuming that you clicked in very, very quickly to the idea that if you want to sell your message, if you want to influence people more so, then you have to do it per technology. You have to be up with the times. Oh, I, I wish I was. Some of the technology is a little bit old, but it works. It works, right? Just like my phone at home, 30 years old. Yeah, you were telling me about oh, it. Oh, and just, and just like, and just, <laughs> and just like and speaking of technology, so uh, just like my, my flip phone. There we go. Oh, you don't have a smartphone. No, don't have a smartphone. Your, your, your parents, as we said before, went through the concentration camps. And um, they obviously had very difficult lives. Um, your father passed away two years ago. Three years ago, almost. is it? And how long your mom? How long is your my mom? My mom was uh, 1999. 1999, right? Yeah. So, so over um, 20 years ago, yeah. Your your last name is Sis C I S S, but that's not your real last name. What's your real last name? It's Lubobovich. Is that what it is? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> actually, actually, yeah, you got me there. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, it it is. If you know, if you know the Torah, it, it, and I'm a coin, it, it's tzis. What was and so the tzis is tzis is very close to the word tits. Yeah. What was the tits? Tits was the headband right. that the Kohen wore when he was officiating in the temple. And my uh, parents, according to tradition, my father uh, comes from uh, a line of Kohenim. So my own, and the, the name was never shortened. Um, and was pronounced in the old country as tis, tis. Yeah. Um, and my only uh, assumption is it's a link to the tzitz that was on the coin's head. But um, that was the name. It was pronounced in some dialects as chis. Right. So, um, um, so my, dad, my, my, my father used to be called Mr. Cheese. They call him Mr. Cheese. Yeah, I'm sure he appreciates. So I that. decided to change the name of our organization because my name is now Cheese for Jews for Cheeses. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> Just kidding. You're like our little Gouda. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Marty is a, uh, is a mutual friend of ours, Marty Gallant. So it's interesting. I, I sent you um, in in the pictures. I don't know, maybe you could put it on display here. Uh, Marty Gallant, very very special person. I grew up. You mentioned I was a child of Holocaust survivors. I was quite the introvert. Yeah. Quite shy, and actually paralyzed at just trying to talk to people. Couldn't do it. Are you shy now? Uh, I think inherently I, I, I am somewhat uh, shy, but I've, I've learned to overcome it, uh, okay. as you can tell. Yeah. Um, but when I was 14, I went to a party with a youth group called AZA BBG. It's kind of an evening party. And I went there. I, I was so shy. Just I, I couldn't say boo to nobody. But there was this guy there, Marty, came up to me and said, hey, how you doing? What's your name? But then they started talking to me, and, and that was yeah. Marty. And it was like, became a friend. And Marty, from that age, of the, that, that is 14 years old, uh, has uh, been a, pro, uh, a, a good friend. And what was really interesting about um, the relationship in those uh, early days is he taught me to be less inhibited, yeah. to be in touch with my um, creative self in terms of communication, to be in touch with my sense of humor, which I don't have, but I just like to work. <laughs> yeah, I think um, you do, Julie. Yeah. No, to be in touch with my <laughs> sense of humor and and have a um, strong openness to spontaneity. And um, and and the truth is, I think it was uh, as as uh, um, a psychological lesson, something that is not easy for so many people. You know, I worked with a lot of young people when I was teaching at the Ontario College of Art, and it's amazing how people can be. Um, uh, socially and verbally inhibited. Yes, um, it's a very difficult thing to overcome. And um, but having a friend who supports you and who who loves you and shares um, time with you and talks to you, I think is so so important for all of us. You know, it, it says in Pirkei Elvis, you know, we don't want to make ourselves a friend. You know, some some people sometimes jokingly said, "Well, I don't have too many friends." And I said, I often say, well, I have one. <laughs> yes. You know, all you need is one good friend. That's it, true. It can make the world a difference. So Marty, it's, Marty it's a real Gallen, gift. Marty Gallon, just to give some context, Marty Gallon and I did 
uh, radio and TV ten together. 10 years. Yeah, for 10 years. What was the show called? Called Marty and Avram, The Food Guys. Yeah. And we did Marty and Avram, Beer Buddies, and so on and so forth. And Marty would, I think he would give you credit too, because he was also in his own way. I mean, he Marty's always been very different. He's got frizzy hair. He's very boisterous, very out there. If you didn't know Marty or don't know him well, you might think that he's a little cuckoo. Well, and, yes, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. And he grew up in a community which was pretty mainstream. He really started to become much more effusive and come out of himself when he started to go to school downtown. But I think he accredits, uh, gives you credit um, for being his first friend as well. Really? Yes, I think he does. Hmm. And, and I think well, he I gives, stuck with him too, through thick and thin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He and would, vice versa. Yeah, he would say, you guys are really, really tight. And even to this day, after 55 years or whatever it happens to be, you guys talk every single day. You go down and help him out because he's having his medical challenges. Like, you're a very good friend to him. And I think he's and a good friend to him. And you are to him as well. We do our best. Yeah. We do our very best. He's a lovely human being. Lovely human being. The important thing is here, the, the lesson we can learn from a friend. You know, we yeah. cannot take them for granted. Never. And, and be thankful. You know, for those of us that pray, sometimes we have to pray and be thankful for many things in our lives. One is having the friends we have. Yes. And of course, the loved ones in our life as well, right? Yep. Your wife, your daughter, right? My son. I, I just had a heart attack. And I think a positive thing that came out of the heart attack, if you will, is the outpouring of love that I received. I was absolutely overwhelmed, Julius by the phone calls that I got and the emails and the visits. And then someone posted online, I think it's called the Meal Train. Are you familiar with it? No. It's essentially, it's a website where you can sign up to send a meal to an individual wow. who's in need on a particular day. And a lot of people sign up. So every single day since I've come home, I've received a different meal for dinner Pretty amazing. from another person. And th that, that is the beautiful thing about our yeah. community, isn't yeah. it, Julius? Yeah. Unbelievable. Like people really come out of the woodwork when someone's in trouble, right? People don't realize yeah, that. Yeah, you know, yeah. That, you know, you were just uh, a little while ago in our uh, discussion talking about stereotypes that are negative. This is the opposite. This stereotype that is positive. Right. The, the, the charity and the kindness and the sharing that goes on. Pretty amazing. It is absolutely amazing. Do, do you have any stories like that yourself where people have reached out to you in time of ch times of challenge? Well, I do know that... Um, for me, I think uh, the, um, the one area where I really feel that is when we've had to sit Shiva. Yeah. The seven days of mourning from when we lost a loved one. I recently uh, had to sit Shiva from my father. Then I had to sit Shiva from my brother. And for me, that, that, that's, that, that comes to mind as an example of community compassion for somebody that is above and beyond. Because people don't have to come. And um, prior to me experiencing it recently and personally, um, I felt a, a little awkwardness about doing the same uh, kindness to others when they were uh, sitting in a house of mourning. But having been on the receiving end of Shiva, it teaches me how valuable and how important and yeah. how rich it is to be able to share uh, that kind of uh, consolation for others. I want to conclude the show by telling you something that I have told you personally and privately, and I think this is a really good time to announce it to others, and that is how I feel about you. I have always felt that you are a giant of a human being. I know. And the reason I say that is because you have had challenges in your life of a personal nature, and you've always struck me as an individual who faced those head on. And you've always struck me as the type of individual who did so really with a smile on your face. Like you, whenever I see you, you're cheery. You really are, and you have a lovely smile, and you have a very uh, a shining face, a shine, shining demeanor. And I've told you this for many years, and I tell Marty this too. Uh, you have enormous shoulders. You're able to handle a lot. You're able to take a lot. You've helped family members in their times of, uh, of, of struggles. And uh, I was always very envious of that because I'm not sure my, my shoulders are as broad as yours. They're pretty broad. Well, they might be, Julius, but I'll tell you, you have to thank God every minute for what you have because you have a lot of blessings, man. 
Hmm. You really do. Your character is powerful. It's strong. You've made a big difference in a lot of people's lives. And uh, my interaction with you, and it's been for many, many years, it started through Marty. And, you know, we remember be, you met Marty at my house for Pesach. That's, that's it was the a, first time I met you that's for right. Pesach Cedar that's downtown. A, yeah, that's exactly right. And you always just struck me as, a, as an individual who had his feet on the ground. And despite the challenges that God threw at you, man, you stand up tall and you face them. Thank so, Kola Kavot to you, my friend. Kola to you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I, I'm delighted to be able to tell you that on the air. And I okay. feel that I feel that with all my heart, Julius. I, I do. I really appreciate yeah. it. That's uh, a very um, sincere and touching expression of love. And I appreciate it. It, it truly is. It truly is. And I also...